Welcome. You're late. Just kidding. We're late. <laughs> it's an object lesson because today is all about the blame game. So I just want you to be curious what was going on with you while you were waiting for us. So we'll get to that later. Um, so welcome to Midday Mindfulness. We are so excited to have you here with us today. Uh, this is the Center for Mindfulness, Compassion and Res Resilience at ASU. And today we have a few of our team members here. We've got Dr. Nika Gwechi, Tara Cash, and Hannah Layton. Hannah may or may not be on the video. She has um, things going on with her um, internet. So we'll take her as long as we can have her presence. We really appreciate Hannah's visual presence. She'll be with us all hour, even if she's not here where you can see her. My name is Dr. Terry Pipe, and I'm Arizona State University's Chief Wellbeing Officer. Uh, and we're here today to practice mindfulness, compassion, and resilience. And just a few words about those before, those ideas before we get started. And really to us, they're so much more than ideas. They're ways of being in the world. We practice them here so that we can go out into our lives, all of us, and uh, have a little bit more awareness and love and compassion and kindness for ourselves and each other and build each other up, not only as individuals, but as communities, therefore resilience. So mindfulness, for us, the way we describe it is being focused and present. We also honor the fact that many, many cultures, in fact, probably all cultures and wisdom traditions have a, a practice of being still and centered. And so we did not make up mindfulness here at ASU. We invent a lot of things here, but mindfulness is not one of them. Uh, but we do have uh, an interesting way of teaching it here. Um, the way that we really want to present it is so that everyone has access to it, right? Equitable mindfulness, mindfulness for all. So no matter what your background is, no matter where in the world you are today, no matter how old you are, no matter if you've practiced mindfulness or never have, you belong right here, right now. And we'll go through practices that I think will, um, will mean something for you, they, they have for us. Um, and if not, that's fine too. Just please keep an open mind. We love healthy skepticism. So if, you have, if you're feeling skeptical or you're feeling some resistance, perfectly fine. That belongs here in this space too. So focus and presence, that's mindfulness. Uh, many scientists and practitioners and educators have also added many, many uh, deep levels of understanding to mindfulness that go way beyond focus and presence. And we also honor all of that. Uh, but again, to make it streamlined and accessible, these are the words that, that we use. And that might help you if you're talking to somebody else and trying to describe what, what in the world is mindfulness. You can always fall back on presence and focus, and you'll, you'll get at least the kernel of, of the practice there. So that's mindfulness. Compassion is when we bring awareness and aliveness through mindfulness to our own experience. Often what happens is we learn to be a bit more understanding and kind and accepting with ourselves, no matter how we show up. And um, it doesn't mean that we take away our goals, or our aspirations. We all want to be better people tomorrow than we are today. Uh, and that, that's fine, that's perfectly fine. But it's also really helpful to present compassion and kindness to ourselves on the journey, on, in our day-to-day, moment-by-moment lives. And when we do learn compassion and learn to talk to ourselves with a sense of um, friendliness, and support, often what happens is that that spills out beyond us. And it spills out to those that we are with, those that we are connected with through our lives and through our work, through your communities, through maybe through your families. Um, you just can't really help it. Compassion will start to grow and spill over. And the world needs a little bit more compassion these days. Always has, always will. But today, I think today in these times that we're living, I think a little bit more compassion would serve us really well. And then resilience, learning to uh, be with the situation as it is, 
without trying to push away, coerce, or change anything. Um, it, it builds our muscles. It builds our muscles for acceptance. And again, this is not to say that we uh, don't want things to be different or that we won't work hard to improve the conditions um, externally and internally that we're living in. But when we can learn to sit with pain and discomfort, and I mean sit um, in a certain way, I mean like live with or hold or uh, move through life, holding cravings, holding urges, holding... Um, the, the things that would take us away from the person that we want to be, when we can hold those things with an evenness of mind and temperament, we become stronger. And as communities and countries and the world, when we begin to really acknowledge our reality with clear observer status, we can learn then to move the next step. And so resilience is a way that we uh, do grow stronger in the face of adversity, not just um, get through it, but really grow through it. And uh, we're facing a lot of adversity right now. So a little bit about our the history of why we're here together today. In March, we had planned a two-day conference, our annual conference at the Mindfulness Center. And we uh, canceled that because of COVID-19. And we decided to really focus on what could we provide? What could we give? Um, you know, just because one door shuts, it doesn't mean every door closes. <laughs> so we decided to uh, create these daily sessions. And uh, you all have, have really uh, stepped up along with this team in terms of creating and attending and engaging with this community. Because the real goal here was to um, broaden and deepen our community, not just at ASU, not just in Phoenix or Arizona, but across the United States, across the world. And we have had participants and continue to have participants all across the globe, which we're really grateful for. And that brings me to something that I really want to, to drive home, which is you, if you're joining us on the live chat, the YouTube channel, which you can subscribe to and you'll get prompts to practice with us. Um, if you're joining us, you had the chance to engage with us today and we hope that you will say something, tell us where you are, tell us how this is impacting you. And, and by this, I mean the mindfulness practice. Um, tell us what you'd like to learn. If there are themes that we haven't gotten to, uh, let us know because we are really open to your ideas and your questions. Your questions we collect every day and on Thursdays, like tomorrow, we will have a community well-being session and we answer your questions and have conversation about them. And it's really interesting to see because all of us have different backgrounds and different perspectives on things and we just kind of chat things through and I always learn something and I, I hope that you will too. So that is the introduction. I would really encourage you to, to chat with us today and um, let us know your questions and your preferences and, and anything else that is on your mind. Today's uh, topic is blame, the blame game. And I need to give a big uh, credit and shout out to someone across the world that I don't know, but I learned from so much. Her name is Fleur Chambers. And she's a teacher on the app called Insight Timer. I believe she's from Australia and she has a beautiful way of expressing thoughts and, and really um, deep challenges. And so I've, I've learned from her in, in several of her classes and today we'll be um, encapsulating some of the ideas that she's presented in um, a course. And this is session eight of, of a course and it really talks about how do we get through blame. So we, it's pretty much a universal experience, it turns out. But before we get there, let's do a practice to get us centered, and then we'll start talking about blame. So if you would, just come into a comfortable posture. You don't need to worry about where your feet or your arms or your hands, how your head is positioned. You don't need to worry about any of that today. Just come into a comfortable position. And if you'd like to, you can close your eyes or just soften your gaze. And bring your attention into your body, wherever you consider the center of your body. For some people, that is your head, your brain. For some people, it might be your eyes, 
the area between your eyes. For some people, it's your throat or your heart, the area around your heart. Some people, your gut, your tummy, wherever it is for you, when I say your center, that's the right place. There's no, no absolute here. So bringing your focus to your center and just checking in with yourself right now, seeing how you are. Maybe you've had a full and active day today, or maybe it, you're just starting your day. Just noticing what's been going on in your mind, how your body feels, what your emotional tone is. And just seeing for right now, if you can cultivate a sense of curiosity, just observing what's here for you, not really telling yourself a story about it, but just noticing what is present when you start to draw inward. So as you're noticing and checking in, there may be distractions that happen, thoughts or noises, emotions. Just see if you can notice the distraction and then bring your focus back to your center. Know that you can check in with your center multiple times through the day. It's sort of a homework assignment to just continue to check in with yourself as, as this time together goes by and also as your practice ends and you go into your day-to-day -day life, just knowing that you can check in with your center at any time. And that's a very good uh, gauge, barometer, compass for you about what is going on and how you would choose to respond. We often feel uh, sort of like a, I don't know, a pinball, uh, a ping pong ball just being batted about by life. But that's often not the case. Often we can respond if we just check in with ourselves. Take a, a moment or a breath to pause before moving forward with behaving or speaking or even thinking the next thought. So mindfulness presents us with agency and autonomy in a way. Being able to rise above and observe your, your reactions and responses so that you can make them with a more informed uh, choice. So now bringing some movements wherever your body would like to move and reopening if your eyes if they have been closed. So thank you for practicing. That was just a simple um, centering practice. And again, you can practice that any anytime and anywhere. You don't have to close your eyes and you don't have to sit still. You can do that as you move through life. All right, so let's talk about blame. Often we talk about judgment and about non-judgment being an attitude of mindfulness. And so blame is sort of like a sibling of, of judgment because um, blame is a shortcut. You know, judgment is often a shortcut in our, our way of thinking, um, an automatic pattern uh, thinking. Well, blame is the same way we can get into these automatic patterns of blame. And when I talk about blame, we're gonna start by talking about it with a, a small letter, a small B, not a big B, and not a capital B. So just a little blame. We can get to the big stuff later, and you can deal with that also in therapy and counseling. <laughs> you might need to, I might need to. Um, and that's fine. That's a really good place to, to unpack some of the big blame. But we're going to talk about little blame today. So, and we're going to do it in starting with just lightheartedness. Um, so that often when we talk about things that really hit home, it helps to start with lightness and sort of a, a sense of humor. So... Blaming is a, a shortcut way of helping us make sense with the world. And often we blame um, ourselves, or we can blame other people, or we can blame the world or life in general, right? And so many of us during this pandemic have been living either alone 
or with a limited number of other people. And so I'm going to start by giving you some examples of blame. And it's going to be about my poor husband because he's the only one here to blame other than my dog who's blameless. <laughs> so, <laughs> so I'm, I'm so sorry, Jim. This is not... Um, <laughs> This does not reflect my deep love for you, but I, I just want to give you some examples and maybe you can relate. Okay, so um, in the morning I come out and the dog food is gone. The dog food bowl is empty. Do I blame the dog? No, I blame Jim automatically. Jim is to blame for the empty dog food bowl. Now, is he really? Did he eat the dog food? No, he did not. The dog ate the dog food. Um, but that's the automatic, oh my gosh, something is wrong. I'm going to choose to blame someone. All right. So maybe I get in my car and maybe the, the gas tank is on empty. And uh, who do I blame? Well, it was Jim. <laughs> it was Jim's fault. <laughs> so, so you can see um, it's very easy. And of course, this is not true. That's what I want to get at is in these situations, the blame is not true. All right, sometimes it might be, and that's a different uh, case situation. But in these, the blame is not true. So I just want you to think for a moment, who have you blamed lately for, for things that really weren't their fault? And I'm gonna ask my team, do you have any examples of this? You can, they can be lighthearted or they can be more serious, whatever you'd like. Terry, I am with you. I blame my husband for pretty much everything. And Michael, I love you just so much, but I blame him for the 110 degree heat. I blame him for <laughs> me being grumpy in the morning sometimes, you know, and it's just, it's, it's not fair, but there's nobody else really to blame for the weather or anything like that. Um, so in a lighthearted way, but then I get over it pretty quickly because he is completely not responsible. <laughs> <laughs> Thanks, Nika. Go ahead. <laughs> um, I also blame a lot of people in the morning when I'm um, not a very chipper person. Um, I blame the construction workers for doing their job and, and adding to the noise. Um, I blame a lot when I drive. Um, if people cut me off, um, or if there's traffic, um, I place a lot of blame there. Again, it's nobody's fault. It's just a situation, but I tend, I'm in a habit of blame. I've recently been noticing and, um, yesterday I was on a plane. Um, and usually my instinct, if there's a crying baby is to blame the parents, like how could they not care? <laughs> there was a crying baby and I tried, I brought, my first reaction was this blame of like, how is this happening this whole time? And then I tried to soften and then I blamed the baby a little bit, but then I, I turned it back to me. <laughs> of, I'm the one associating negative emotions. But yeah. Thanks, Hannah. Thanks, Tira. Yeah, I was actually going to talk about the blame game driving because that is definitely my go-to is everyone else is at fault when I'm driving and not me. You know, I actually woke up late, but it's everyone else's fault that I'm late to this meeting. It's nothing to do with me. Um, so that's, yeah, that's my, my main go-to, my little, my little B blames. Uh, <laughs> big B would be myself for sure. You know, blaming ourselves for things that like we have also have no control over. Um, I noticed that a lot when we started talking about this too. Yeah. Thanks. Yeah. I was, I, I was going to say, I, I was surprised you didn't say you don't blame me for everything. <laughs> <laughs> This team is so close that sometimes it does feel like family and and you know often the ones that we blame are the ones that are closest to us um, so in the chat i would be really interested to see if you're willing to just kind of again with a lightness a light touch you know what are the things that you blame the world for blame other people for um, that you can sort of have have a light touch with it and then let's talk about you know how how does it feel to blame so how does it uh how does it feel in your body when you're blaming other people and um yeah let's just talk about that so so i notice about myself that when i start into the blame 
well, there's another aspect here. So often there's a pattern. Like if, if I'm going to blame Jim for one thing, well, why not blame him for the next thing and the next thing and the next thing? So, so there might, or if I'm blaming myself or if I'm blaming society, um, you know, it's just like one, it's a big old add on. It's like a, a snowball for those of you that know what snowballs are. It's a foreign concept in Arizona right now, but you know, it's just like this gathering of, of blame that just sticks right on there. And to me, I feel it a lot in my, my stomach and in my uh, heart area, and I can feel it in my jaws. And it is not unlike my stress response. You know, it's very clearly um, similar. So I'm seeing you nod your heads. Is this, do you feel this too? Yeah, I definitely feel very, very similar to the stress response. Um, uh, almost exactly the same in the chest, tightness in the throat. Um, definitely as close to the stress and anger response as you can get. Yeah, yeah, thanks, Nika. Yeah, I would say for me, they're a little different for, for stress um, and anxiety. It's more like in my skin, but I think that blame has um, a more hurtful place in my body. It really hurts in my, in my chest and in my, my head. I feel just a hardening, like a stiffness um, that I think like if I don't take care of it, it turns into resentment, which also shows up in my emotional responses as a hardening towards others or towards a situation. Um, so I've noticed. Yeah. Thank you, Anna. That, that's really um, sort of leads into the next um, part, which is emotionally, you know, how, how blame feels. And often it is um, this feeling of being deeply misunderstood or deeply, um, uh, that there's injustice, you know, that, that, that something was, was done to me, like traffic was done to me, <laughs> or, you know, the, the air pollution was done to me. And, um, and so that can also escalate. So the emotional and the physical, of course, are interwoven and, and they'll go back and forth and sort of um, build one off of the other. Often when we're, we blame, we also feel, it can help us to feel isolated or again, misunderstood. So that it's, it builds that wall between us and other or us and the world. So sometimes we, we just blame life. You know, life is just rotten right now. I didn't get my report get done because life is just rotten right now. And so um, it begs the question in certain situations, and, and you have to be the, the driver on this, is what is, what is blaming, how is blaming serving you? You know, how is blaming protecting you? And it could be in very self-protective ways, or it could be, if you get real honest, it could be that your blame is worsening a problem, or it's getting in the way of you really looking at your responsibility in the problem. And, you know, we've, we've talked about lighthearted things when the toothpaste runs out or when we're uh, late for work or whatever it is. So those are, are sort of, you know, they, they might be serious, but they're not the most serious. When we get into the more serious um, things that, that we blame for, of course, the stakes go up and our, our um, tendency to pattern things one after the other goes up. So that you can see if, you know, if I did start to blame Jim for everything, that it would really become, that's my husband, that would, that would become a real separation between us. And it would become a real problem long term. And so if, when you start to notice this piling on of blame, it is a wake up call to sort of examine that sort of truly examine, you know, what is going on? And is it something that that needs to be remedied or examined or talked about and brought to the surface a little bit more. I think it's also worth mentioning that in our world today, you really can't uh, engage with media or um, social media or, um, you know, a lot of people are, are really outwardly blaming right now. And this isn't to blame them. You know, I'm not saying this to blame them. I'm just saying that we do live in a context 
where blame has been normalized and um, actually celebrated. And, and so if we are going to examine ourselves and really look at, at ourselves, we have to be um, extra gentle, right? Because we're, we're sort of living in this river of, of blame. And so if we want to stop in the river and examine ourselves, we just have to be careful that we've got our bearings. <laughs> and mindfulness can help us do that so that we're not swept, swept along. All right. I also just want to mention that um, blaming is different than having boundaries. You know, we all need to have boundaries and we've done a couple sessions about boundaries. This is different than having personal boundaries. That's a healthy uh, response in a relationship. Um, blaming is when everything just becomes uh, piled on and it's, you know, it's, it, it is a patterned automatic behavior. Um, so I see that we have a question in the chat. Uh, does someone want to read that? I can read it. Um, why do some people blame others when they think things are not going right, according to their personal ideas or, or culture, rather than thinking about the other person? So why do we tend to, to blame others when they don't agree with us? Yeah, it's a great question. And um, what I'm, I'm learning about this is that it is, um, this isn't to excuse it, but it is a natural behavior. So we've talked and, and thought pattern. So I'm sorry, blame is not a behavior. Blame is a thought pattern. They're, that's different. So um, just like when we have a stress response and we have that negativity bias, you know, our brains are built to go to the negative. And when we are in a blaming situation, our brains go to the negative and then they assign blame. And that is, you know, in some situations that can be sort of a, our survival mode taken to an extreme and not helping us survive anymore. So blame is universal. I, I think I'm coming to understand. I really think it's universal and it's um, a pattern behavior so that just like any other pattern, the more we use it, the stronger it gets. And so if we want to not blame and if we want to be curious and open instead, that takes practice. So it's, it's there because it's automatic and it's patterned and it's been reinforced just like any other um, sort of negative, negative behavior or thought pattern. And so that, that sort of brings us to the next idea, which is if we, if we wanna unpattern the blame, you know, we, I think that most of us can identify areas in our life. When I started looking for it, it was <laughs> embarrassingly funny how many things I blame other people for or, or just life or, you know, or myself for. And no blame is necessary in most situations. So, so the first step, just like in mindfulness, is to start to be aware, to just see where are you blaming? Are you blaming, and, and I would guess that all of us are doing this, are we blaming in our personal lives with our relationships? Are we blaming in our work lives? Are we blaming in our uh, societal lives, in our sort of about one, one view or another um, in, in life, and especially in our political climate? Are we you know, blaming, there's, there's many sides, but it, it's, it feels often like it's you know, one side against the other. So where do we exert the most energy blaming? So the first step is just notice. You don't have to try to get rid of it yet, just notice. And then if you were to, to soften, to notice like what Hannah was saying about the baby on the plane, <laughs> just like notice what's happening. And then can you let go of it a little bit? Just like in our meditations, when you notice that your jaw is clenched or that your hips are tight or you're holding your toes, can you just let it go a little tiny bit? And what relief comes from that? When, when Anna was talking about the softening that occurred, what happens when you do, when you are able to soften a bit? 
So I thought it might be helpful at this point to do a meditation around blame. Um, and then Hannah has a writing exercise too, but I'm gonna do this one first to sort of get us tuned up and then we'll, we'll do some writing about it too, all right? So for my team, you can um, turn off your cameras if you'd like to. I know sometimes knowing that the world is watching you, <laughs> close your eyes is a little odd. So um, you're welcome to do that. This will be probably a, a less than five minute practice. Um, so, um, to begin with, again, just settle in and get into a comfortable position. You can close your eyes if you'd like. Sometimes it helps to draw inward if you can just soften your gaze or close your eyes. And then just notice uh, who is there inside you right now? Who are you right now? And can you welcome all the parts of you? Can you welcome the part of you that blames can you welcome the part of you that would like to not blame? Can you welcome the criticizing self? Welcome to the stressed or overwhelmed self. Welcome to the resilient and strong self. Welcome to the self that takes things very seriously. And welcome to the self that is lighthearted and fun and laughs a lot. So all of these parts of you are you. And can you welcome them all in right now? Can you welcome in this self who longs for greater patience and greater connection? Can you welcome this self with friendliness and peace and acceptance? Can you really sincerely say to yourself that all parts of me are welcome here? All parts of me. All are welcome here. And can you keep that acceptance going, that ease, that softening? And then just noticing your breath a bit, just noticing the rising and the falling away of your breath. And just practice accepting each breath as it is, not trying to change it, just noticing the breath, accepting it. Allowing your breath to move in and out. And then maybe just uh, bringing the awareness back to our, our topic and just noticing where your blaming habits are the most pronounced. Is it with yourself? Maybe with your work or your family or with life in general? And then just notice where does the blame feel in your body? How does it feel and where? Where does it live in you? Maybe imagining what it looks like. Can you ask your blame why it is here? Why is your blame here? And if there's no reason, that's okay. This question might, might last a while. Can you see what your blame is protecting you from? Now, as you bring your attention back to your inhale and your exhale, just see if you can lengthen the exhale a bit. And with each out breath, 
letting go a little bit of this habit of blame. Just a little bit of every exhale, letting go of this blame just a little bit. See if you can soften inside a bit. See if you can accept yourself and others just as you are, just as they are. Can you say to yourself with, it, with sincerity, I am safe. I am safe. I am peaceful. I accept myself as I am. I accept my relationships just as they are. I accept my life just how it is. And as you let these statements sort of settle in to your consciousness, can you rest here a bit? Just take a rest. See what this sense of deep acceptance has given you today. What a gift it's been to just in this moment extend this acceptance to yourself and to others. And so once again, knowing that you can come back to this practice at any time. Now ending your practice by maybe setting an intention to see if you can soften around blame the next time you notice it and the next time and the next. And so now bringing some movements into your body, to your fingers and toes. Bringing your eyes to open if they've been closed. So with that sense of uh, softening and curiosity and just noticing, I'll hand it over to Hannah for some writing practice. Thank you, Terry. That was so nice. Um, so our, I'll give you a little bit to go gather a pen and paper, or if you want to type on your computer, whatever feels comfortable for you. Um, but we're just going to more tangibly express kind of what we've already been prompted to question. Um, thank you, Terry, for all of the really good discussion points and really good um, questioning. These, these prompts for us to, to look inward. Um, so we're just going to be building off of that. Um, so once you get your pen and paper, um, I'm going to prompt us for a few minutes. If you can, um, list about five situations um, it can be less if, or more if you're feeling, um, if you have a lot to express right now, but about five situations, present or past, in which you place blame on something or someone. Um, for some examples, it can be really, really simple. It could be one word or a sentence, um, but maybe like, I like to hold on to everything, hoard things, because when I was young, I didn't have much at all, something simple like that. Um, and we can try to stick with the small b, the, um, the easy blames, so that we don't uh, dive too far into it, but just some easy blames. Um, yeah, so for a couple of minutes, just list, list things and situations you've caught yourself blaming.
Okay, so you can keep adding to this as much as you want afterwards, but now we're going to look at this list and for each scenario that you wrote about, think about the question, is this my most powerful stance? And I'd like to thank Terry for that question when we were talking about it internally before. Um, but next to, to each of your items on your list, think about, is this my most powerful stance? Um, you can either write a simple yes or no, um, maybe a question mark, maybe you haven't thought it through yet, which is completely fine. Um, and maybe there's a word or a stance that you think might be more powerful, such as patience or acceptance. And if that feels right to you, you can write those words next to your list. Okay, we can always revisit this list later. And a lot of these, um, if this is your first time thinking about blame, I know that I've been reflecting for the past week on it. It's been my, my object of meditation and contemplation um, because it was introduced last week by Terry to our team. And it's something I, I hadn't thought about before. It was a habit I was unaware of. Um, and it's taken me a lot of sitting with each of these things because sometimes we hold on so strongly to blame. Um, and we hold tightly because like Terry said, maybe we feel isolated without it or we feel left out or, um, or misunderstood. Um, and if that's the case, then it takes a while to process and to decide if that's something you want to hold on to. And of course, there are some situations where blame is an acceptable answer. Um, you know, if you get hurt by someone, um, you know, our criminal justice system is around um, holding people accountable. Um, and so in these situations with bigger bees, sometimes it's a little harder um, to let go of. And sometimes it's necessary for personal protection and boundaries. Um, but it's just even making a little list and then coming back to it um, can be a really powerful way to get in touch and to start to process how we blame. Um, so for my group, I'd like to ask if you're willing to share, um, how did it feel? And is there anything that you wrote down that surprised you or that you're not sure if you wanna let go of yet? And I can start maybe with, with my example. Um, Something I wrote down is I blame kind of, I blame coronavirus for making me feel isolated, um, which is something I'm, I don't think blame is the right word for it um, now that I'm reflecting, but it has been my response for it for a long time. Of, I can't see any of my friends. I can't do anything. People aren't wearing their masks, so it keeps going and and I come up with this story, this snowball of, of blame. And yeah, that was one of my, maybe this is the right response, maybe it's not ones. Yeah, thanks so much, Hannah. This is a great exercise and it really gets you thinking um, deeply about things. I have a couple of people uh, but I found that my blame is mostly the big B because I find the, the small B a, a lot easier to let go of and just kind of forget about. Um, but one of those little Bs is uh, I blame one of my old friends. We got into a little argument um, and she blamed me and I blamed her and it was definitely my fault. Um, and it was not my most powerful stance. My most powerful stance should have been not engaging in something that was triggering for me, um, but also to just kind of back, back away, accepting and backing away. And I think that that's a good strategy to just walk and distance ourselves if we know that we're being triggered and that it will end in 
no good. <laughs> I see Tira, I think, is giving me the face like, I don't have anything else to say right now. <laughs> so is that true? So I, I'll share that. Um, so um, the weather, I can blame for, I blame the weather for everything. And it's so silly. And, and it is, um, but it is not my most powerful stance because it is something that I don't have control of. And yet I can respond in a way that is, that is life um, supporting to me. And so just bringing awareness to, you know, where am I, where am I blaming? And, and I, that is a little B. I mean, it's like a, after what Nika shared, which is really, thank you for sharing a more deep and, and, <laughs> and relevant uh, example. Um, what I'm finding is that my list, I've, I've shared most of these with you today already. Um, but I guess where, where we need to go next is when we are blaming, when we find ourselves in the habitual pattern of blaming, with mindfulness is, is how we can address this. We can just notice. So the next time you are blaming someone or yourself or the world, um, just notice what is there for you. How are you responding? Um, maybe ask yourself some of these questions that... Uh, Hannah asked is, you know, what, how, is this your most powerful stance? Is this who you want to be and how you want to be in this moment? And then, you know, Tara Brock, who's also another mindfulness um, educator that I just really admire, she talks about doing a U-turn. Many mindfulness teachers talk about this. So if you're hurting, so often underneath the blame is hurt or being angry or being um, not understanding. Being puzzled, like like COVID nineteen, Hannah blaming COVID nineteen. A lot of that is because we don't understand how could this happen, you know what is happening. So there's this layer of not understanding. So anytime underneath the blame, there's that tender other emotion. The thing to do is a U turn. So tending to yourself, tending to yourself. Maybe this is words that you need to hear. Maybe it's a gentle word of just peace. You, know, you notice yourself blaming and then say to yourself, peace or understanding or whatever the right word for you is. Um, it could be a, a more um, tangible self-care, like take a bath or pick up the phone and talk to a friend or you have something to eat if you're hungry. You know, take care of yourself and just see if you can attend to that part of you that's hurting underneath the, the blame. And so this then becomes not only a mindfulness practice, but a, a compassion practice as well. Um, and, and hopefully a more resilient stance, you know, as we stand more in our ability to respond rather than just react with blame, you know, are there other responses that would be more beneficial and stronger and more powerful? You know, instead of responding with anger at the weather, for me, is there a way that I can be more powerful and prepare myself better for whatever the environment has for me today? So in, in all of these situ situations of blame, there is often a better path forward. And I also want to revisit the fact um, that sometimes blame and accountability are the right responses, right? I mean, there are certain times where it is valid and needed. Um, and sometimes it's time limited. You know, sometimes the blame needs to serve a purpose for a while. And it's worth re-examining how long, how long. And of course that, it depends. It's case by case situation, situation. So, um, I'm wondering, so I have a poem that Nika found that I would love to read to you, but I'm wondering if there are any other questions or ideas that have come to the chat that we should look at right now. We can certainly save some of them for tomorrow, but anything that we need to uplift right now? All right. So um, with care and ease, I would ask you to once again find a comfortable position. And uh, this is 
you can close your eyes if you'd like. And yes, my team, you can turn off your cameras. I've missed your lovely faces, but you can turn off your cameras if you'd like. This is from the book Go In and In by Dana Falls. I've heard from her before. She's an amazing poet. And it's called Awakening Now. So just allowing yourself to receive this poem with openness and curiosity. Why wait for your awakening? The moment your eyes are open, seize the day. Would you hold back when the beloved beckons? Would you deliver your litany of sins like a child's collection of seashells, prized and labeled? No, I can't step across the threshold, you say, eyes downcast. I'm not worthy. I'm afraid and my motives aren't pure. I'm not perfect and surely I haven't practiced nearly enough. My meditation isn't deep and my prayers are sometimes insincere. I still chew my fingernails and the refrigerator isn't clean. <laughs> Do you value your reasons for staying small more than the light shining through the open door? Forgive yourself. Now is the only time you have to be whole. Now is the sole moment that exists to live in the light of your true self. Perfection is not a prerequisite for anything but pain. Please, oh please, don't continue to believe in your disbelief. This is the day of your awakening. This is the day of your awakening. So with that gentle reminder, don't wait until you're perfect. Reopen your eyes, come back into your uh, environment. My environment holds a lot of noise in it right now, so I'm going to, without blame, I'm going to end this practice um, and wish you well. Please stay well, stay connected, stay safe, <laughs> and I wish you peace on your journey. <laughs> Bye.